I have the pleasure of interviewing Howard Stephen Friedman. He is a data scientist, health economist, and writer. He teaches at Columbia University and has decades of experience in the public sector, private sector, and academia. Howard and I have collaborated on a few consulting projects, and he was the director of Capital One, where he led teams of data scientists, statisticians, analysts, and programmers in various areas of operations and marketing. He later formed private companies that provided consulting services in the areas of designing, developing, and modeling data, touching on industries as diverse as teleco, healthcare, retail, insurance, and real estate. He's co-authored a hundred scientific articles and book articles in areas of data science, applied statistics, health economics, and politics. His most recent release, Ultimate Price, has been covered by major media, including National Public Radio and the Journal Science, and is being translated into a number of foreign languages. Those are certainly things that I want to predict. Say that again, please. Oh, you're recording. <laughs> Other examples, predictive modeling in healthcare. What else would you do to try and predict things? What things would you want to predict? Trend rates. Absolutely. We have these large scale changes in demographics over time. We have changes going on in terms of what are the healthcare treatments. So I want to see what's going on in trends. Right now, we're in the middle of the pandemic. And we can understand that there are lots of transitions happening as vaccination rates go up and trends associated with ER usage, ICU usage, inpatient usage associated with COVID and non-COVID is changing. And then the ramifications. Efficacy. So there's a lot of uh, telemedicine happening. Is it effective? Can I predict who will receive the best care via telemedicine? So many examples in healthcare. Of course, it's a business. So predicting who might be the most expensive patients over time or the least expensive patients is very important for a health insurance company. And predicting who is the best candidate for a particular drug is very important. Bring in genetics information, bringing in biomarkers, all different types of information to find the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. That's all predictive modeling. A lot of that work is work that I get involved in regularly, so it gets me very excited. But let's go to the next one, finance and insurance. Predictive modeling and finance and insurance. Credit card companies, they're doing predictions, right? They have to predict what's the probability that someone is going to charge off. If they charge off and don't pay us, how much do I owe them? That's a big, big deal. Are they going to declare bankruptcy? If so, how much will the company lose? Investment banks have to make predictions all the time related to what's the future profitability of a company. How much should they be investing in that company? Private equity firms constantly do this, as well as venture capital. But I know we have life insurance people on here. So life insurance people, don't raise your hands because I can't see your hands. But give me some suggestions. What are some of the types of predictive models that happen and are necessary in life insurance industry? Go for it. I'm watching the chat box. Type away. I don't see anyone. Mortality, absolutely. Now, interestingly, there are these life tables, and life tables are very, very important, but there are improvements you can make by using machine learning models on predicting mortality. And I've done a lot of this work. You can get a better prediction of mortality using that than using the good old fashioned tools of life tables and logistic regression and splitting them up in Kaplan Meier curves. You can outperform that. Fraudulent claims, couldn't agree more. In fact, my first big job out of graduate school was identifying fraud cases. Fraud cases in credit cards, fraud cases associated with applications of fraud. Predicting mortality using prescription and medical data. Absolutely. Take that information. There are some standard mortality uh, indicators, and there's a metric. It's called the Dale Charlson comorbidity score. But if you layer on medication information, you'll get a more accurate prediction. If you layer on demographics, you get more information. But to put all that information together, best approach, Supervised machine learning. It's a fantastic approach. Well, you've got great ideas there, and I don't want to interrupt you on that, but let's see what else we can talk about. Now, the first thing I want to mention is data science playbooks. So 
you talk about where I can use data science in general and predictive modeling. And the interesting thing is throughout a company, there's many, many, many different places it can be. Now, I described and you gave me some great examples of use cases. Cases, for example, like lapse rate. Is someone going to simply stop paying? Do I have to worry about nutrition? Right. So predicting churn and turnover. Well, that's a great example of operations metrics. But there's so many other applications. Thinking about assessing your models and how to optimize them. Segmenting your customers. There are some restrictions, but you can do often improvements in your models by segmenting them. Maybe I should build standalone models for men versus women. By the way, and in at least one state in the United States, you're not allowed to do that for uh, life insurance. Does anyone know what state? Don't worry about it. In Ohio. Probability analysis. You can try to figure out using the modeling what is the most profitable product currently as well as over time by projecting using expected changes in demographics. Site selection. Oh, if you want to know the answer, don't worry. It's in my book. Read the book and you'll find out the answer. Go right to the life insurance chapter. Trust me. Site selection. You've got multiple locations and you need to provide health care or you have multiple agents selling life insurance. Should they be physically located in certain places? Are they physically traveling? Is it all virtual today? You can try to figure out what are the best locations for your business. How? Predictive modeling associated with what factors influence profitability. Forecasting. Good old fashioned time series forecasting, very effective. I ran forecasting team for a number of years, but we enhanced it using examples of machine learning as well. So it wasn't just good old fashioned forecasting. Continuing to dig into that, as well as human resources modeling. No matter what company you are, there's always a human resources department. What do they do? They hire people. They promote people. They let people go. You can use analytics to try and figure out who is most likely to be a successful employee in the company. Who's likely to attract? You can do those types of things using predictive modeling. Okay, great. Well, is my company a good candidate for this? Or is a company I'm looking for a good candidate for it? It all depends. I worked a lot with private equity firms, so I'm going to give you the lens that a private equity firm thinks about. When they want to ask themselves, is this company ready for predictive modeling? Key question they have is, do they have a lot of data already? Or are they just not aware of data? Known facts, are they behind the industry? Do they know what's out there? And do they know their competitors might be a lot stronger? If so, that is definitely a sign that they have an opportunity. The human resources capacity, do they have people who can do this? Because if they don't have any people who can do this, maybe they hire consultants, but you have to be able to absorb what the consultants do. Nobody wants to get a black box that they can't understand and can't understand if it's going wrong. What about the IT team? Is the IT team able to incorporate predictive modeling into the regular work? If so, great. If not, that's a problem. And what about the culture? Is the management supportive or not? Because if the management is not on board at the CEO level, you're never going to find a strong encouragement for predictive modeling. Luckily, life insurance has relied on predictive modeling for its entire existence. If it doesn't do predictive modeling, it's simply not going to exist. On the other hand, risk splitting and who can split risk best is a critical differentiating factor for many life insurance companies. Some of them try to differentiate themselves based on sales but others try to have the best model, some on customer service. Well, that's about the company, but what about the where? Where in the company should I be working if I talk about predictive modeling? Well, you'd like to work at the senior management level. At a minimum, the senior management have to understand and appreciate what you're doing, because if they're not on board, your project is going to not have enough budget. It's going to get siloed. It's not going to go for so they Howard, need to be can I board. ask a question here about, uh, Go for so one thing on this exam is you're tasked to explain things to a non-data science audience. Like you might fit a machine learning model and then explain it to your sales and marketing team. What types of graphs or statistics can you use to simply convey the usefulness of the model? 
Great question. So there's a lot of technical models, uh, statistics you can use. You can talk about lift curves. You can talk about those things. But at its core, my experience is I don't focus on graphs. If I'm talking to a non-technical audience, and when I say non-technical, it's someone who isn't usually using graphs in their regular conversation, I give them a few bullet points, take-home messages. What is the difference? So let's say I'm talking about there's a new machine learning model that has been implemented that is more accurate at predicting the probability that a patient will be readmitted to the hospital. Okay, it's a new model. It replaced the old one. I just try to explain, we have a new model. It's slightly more advanced in its structure and the data elements we use, and it's more accurate than the old one. It is, and I'll give them a number, X percent more accurate. And if they're really interested, they'll try to get, figure out what does that X percent mean, but they may not need it. So I really try to minimize the amount of details I provide and I focus on the big picture. So new predictive model, what makes it different? Usually some data sources are different and some of the advanced modeling assumptions are different. Beyond that, they just need to know it's new, it's better, it's this much better. And then when they wanna know what this refers to, that's an interested party. That's the one I might dig into further and start working on the graphs. But I don't wanna turn people off from a conversation that way. Back to who in the organization, you had marketing right there and they can be fantastic partners. Why? Because the biggest challenge with marketing is ever showing, did it, did it do any good? I spent millions of dollars on marketing. What was the return on investment? So if you're able to show what was the originally predictive response or the projected sales and an accurate projection of sales, what is your degree of accuracy? And then what was the response to the market? The marketing campaign, that's great. It's nice when it's a A-B campaign, right? And you know things are randomized and it's easy to do, but it's not always that way. And so trying to understand how you can show value is critical. Of course, business intelligence teams, they're always providing updates, information, but how to make it a little bit more advanced, more technical, more value add, they're happy to learn. And human resources is always interested in understanding how can they show the value of their work? How can they do a more effective job of recruiting? How can they do a better assessment of the candidate? How can they determine if the salary is appropriate? So predictive modeling can certainly help if they have a large database associated with what is their recruiting experience. And they can use that to assess what are the factors at the point of making a hiring decision, which are most critical in terms of predicting who will have career success. The challenge is defining what is career success, but that's something you work out within the human resources department. There's a broader question of data strategy, and that's a lot of fun. That's the one to do with the senior management, where you start and you have the conversation. What are our opportunities throughout the organization? What can we do better? Where are we behind? And that's a nice benchmarking exercise. If you have people internally, that's great. It's a perfect blue sky session where everyone you see in this who list is involved in the dialogue. And then from there, you have to figure out, do I need to make changes in my infrastructure? What modeling should I do? What's the top priority? And where can I get the value? Prioritizing your predictive modeling is absolutely critical. So we need to make sure that when you put that effort in, you're going after your best opportunity, and then that you can implement it afterwards. Nobody wants a, an incredible model that can't be implemented. I'm going to give you a couple examples, only a couple, but then I'm going to pause and I'm going to hand it right back to Sam. So in terms of predictive modeling, there's so many different areas where it can be applied. One of the main ones that I like to focus on is loyalty programs. Loyalty programs are when someone is coming back for a reward over time. And what you can do is you can segment those populations into different groups. You can find what makes them excited and not excited. You can identify who are the most profitable customers, as well as try to figure out what is their desired, in this case for a restaurant, what are their favorite things that they might want to try? New foods, more expensive foods, higher margin foods. If you're talking about healthcare, take everything I said about a restaurant, and change it around. It's a patient. How do I segment my patients into different groups? What's the most appropriate way to do it? 
Who are the most profitable patients? How do I minimize my downside for the most expensive patients? How do I manage that? Each example from one industry has the same insights for another industry. Site selection model. You've got 200, 300 locations for a retail chain. You wanna figure out which are the next sites that I should plant if I'm gonna open up a new location. Okay, great. But what if instead of talking about a retail chain, I'm talking about something different? I'm talking about where do I provide my healthcare service? Which ones are the best locations from a patient point of view, from a profitability point of view? What about if I have physical locations for life insurance sales offices? Which are my most profitable ones? Which are my least profitable ones? Where's their cannibalization? When I open up a new office, what is my predicted profitability? Site selection modeling is critical. Modeling risk. Well, that is the bread and butter of life insurance companies and health insurance companies. But modeling that risk, you have many different ways you can approach it. As you start doing it, think about what's the breadth of variables you can include. The truth is, having a rich data set is the biggest game in town. If you have a lot of variables that are strongly predictive, you can build a good model, even with a simple assumption. Add more variables, you'll get a higher lift before you even invest in making the models far more complicated. My biggest early win was not from taking a simple regression model and making it advanced. It was finding a data source no one had thought of before linking the telephone systems to the transaction systems. And the use of the telephone by our customers was an indicator of risk. The person who just started opening up an account and was calling us all the time, they were risky. But we didn't understand that until I was able to connect those data sets. Huge lift, my algorithm only got slightly more complicated, but it was about getting those extra variables into the model. Of course, there's lots of other fancy things you can do later. Got a client right now, who is scaling up real estate uh, at a national level. It's a fantastic client. And they need to predict how much rent can they charge for apartments. Well, if the prediction model isn't accurate, they don't know if they should buy the apartment or not. It might be a bad investment, it might be a good investment. So they need an accurate model. What data variables can I use? Well, what can I scrape off the web? What's already available? What do I know from the literature is already important? What model structure should I use? Should it be a regression model? Should it be a random forest, a GBML? Should I cluster? Should I segment my populations? The answer is, it's data science. Let's check it out. Let's figure it out. And so that's a really, really fun project. I'm going to pause. I did put my contact information up there. You're more than welcome to send me emails if you have questions. And of course, Sam can uh, provide it as well uh, offline, but I'm going to stop at this point. I'm going to stop sharing. And Sam, did you, um, did you have any thoughts or questions you want to share with me about uh, predictive modeling in the real world? Yeah, I just wanted to tell everyone who's about to take this exam next week that this is going to be really useful for your writing because you do need to just put words on the page. The, uh, you need to write like 1,500 to 2,000 words that used to be in the executive summary, it's now sort of spread out through the report. So all these business applications, like he talks about you know, limitations of data, um, you know, different applications of predictive modeling and being able to talk to different departments like sales, marketing, IT, you can use that just to add paragraph and paragraph. You can really just write a novel in your exam and that will really show that you have domain expertise that you really understand the material well, and it will help you to stand out. So you'll get more points on those questions. Even if you're a little bit wrong, even if your models aren't perfect, you can just, you know, do what Howard just did and show that you have uh, a degree of confidence and uh, credibility in what you're doing. Structure your thoughts. Let me tell you how, because I have to read a million essays. You know, I teach at Columbia. What I love it is when I'm grading and I've seen that the person has already structured their thoughts and they go ahead and they tell me at the beginning where they're gonna take me. So we have this project, the following things I wanna be concerned about, 
the data sources and the breadth of the data sources, the data cleaning, how clean is the data? What will I have to do to wrangle that data? The modeling, the outcomes, the implementation. And I'm gonna talk about each of the five in my following paragraphs. I may not even read the, the, the whole thing at that point because I know that they're in good shape. How you start your response frames everything. So start strong with giving an understanding of where you're going to take us in the story. Yeah, and also um, uh, showing the showing the the value of your model rather than showing all the details. Like let's say you fit a generalized linear model, or and you could show like the the quantile quantile plots and the deviance residuals graphs and the R squared and the adjusted R squared. But if you show that to like a sales rep, they're not going to know what that means. But if you just show them, you know, an accuracy metric, then you can, um, you know, explain to them how that's going to, you know, improve their business. Um, when it comes to like, you know, classification problems, um, you know, one, one thing I think you talked about was um, like optimizing for the business outcome as opposed to just the statistical outcome. If you just look at like the AUC, you know, you can just choose the, the um, you can just choose the model that has the highest AUC, but you know, what if there's like, you know, an imbalanced data set where there is, you know, like let's say you're doing um, fraud, you know, fraudulent accounts and only like 1% of fraudulent accounts, uh, only 1% of accounts are fraudulent, but you need to be really thorough in not missing any accounts that are fraudulent because that could cost your bank you know 10 million dollars um how would you like show a um like let's say you're, you're talking to like a bank manager um that your model's going to be reliable you know what types of um you know statistics or outcomes or graphs could you use to show that you know you remind me of a great story sam so one of the other big wins i had early on to your point was related to fraud. And when I came into the bank, they prioritized all of their fraud cases based on the probability of fraud. Whatever case had the highest probability was the one they did first. To which I said, I'm sorry, I thought we were a business. I thought we care about dollars. Maybe we prioritize it by what is our expected loss or maximum expected loss. Put this in terms of dollars and we flipped it all the way around and we changed that algorithm. Just the prioritization, what do I work on first? And as it turned out, that alone saved tens of millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars. So at its core, a business is a business. Focus on the dollars. Yeah, and a great example of that uh, for everyone in the class was the hospital readmissions exam where you are predicting people who get readmitted and then you assign a cost. So you say, okay, if someone, it does have to go back to the hospital that costs a you know, hundred dollars per month. And then if someone goes home successfully, they don't cost anything. And so you um, look at the confusion matrix and you assign a dollar value to each, you know, group of it's true, positive, false, positive, false, negative, true, positive, you know, and then you choose your cutoff value to maximize the cost uh, that's a, that's a question that comes up frequently because they sort of have you fit a model and then they want you to take Microsoft Excel and like do some financial analysis um, on the on the on the end to to do just that. Um, one question is about um, model selection. You know, we have different types of models: uh, decision trees, linear model, generalized linear models lots of extensions of GLMs with like stepwise selection and then, you know, boosted trees and bagged trees. Um, how do you know, or what are the, what are the pros and cons of each method? You know, what, what, what's your, like your to-do list when you're, when you're choosing a model? Is that a question for me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, there's a few things out there. One thing that I even start with is a conversation with a client on the trade-off between complexity and performance, because they themselves may decide that they only have a limited amount of capacity for complexity. Often, stratified models will outperform a single model, but stratifications can get confusing. So I start with the question of, if I stratify your customer segments, 
What's the amount of strata that you can deal with? So I'm worried about operations, and that's a main thing that I care about. Verse, and, and I balance that with performance. So what I, for example, if I have a trivial linear regression model, and that comes within 0.2% of my most advanced GVML model, I'm going to have the honest conversation. Is this worth the complexity? You get a little bit more prediction, but do you want it? And some clients will say yes, some clients will say no. When I start with this stratification, I'll ask them operationally, what can you handle? I'll explain to them, what does stratification do for you? Why am I doing it? But then they will come back with a reasonable answer. And the reasonable answer will control the level of complexity. So I'm very, very concerned whenever I do modeling, not just about how well the model does, but operationally, can they use the model afterwards or is it just simply unmanageable? Stratification, fantastic question. When you take your population and you divide them into subgroups and then you build models on the subgroups, clustering would be a good example of it, but it isn't always clustering. In the medical space, often they just, they stratify, they define subgroups based on age or sex or a particular comorbidity stage or a particular insurance stage. So they have these subgroups and they model the subgroups separately. So that's what I mean by stratification. Truth is, some companies can handle a lot of that. They're okay having 20 models running at the same time. Others say, too confusing. We don't want to deal with it. Two, three models at most. So operations is my biggest concern. Performance, I kind of combine that in the conversation with them. Because the biggest failure you can have is to have an amazing model that you spent so much time building and no one will ever use it. What you don't want is someone to call you an academic. <laughs> Howard, I am going to put you You see on that the email here. from Columbia University, don't be called an academic. I'm going to show them you that the you can deliver models. And ask you the same question that I asked two data scientists last time and see uh, how you answer it. So this is a um, one of the practice exams and it's apartment applicants. So for each property, you're predicting the number of people who are going to apply for that property based on the characteristics like the size of the unit, if it has air conditioning, if it has a garage. Um, and so you're given you know, a data set, you split it up into training and test sets. And what you wanna do is to make a model that um, is as accurate as possible. And then this question is asking you to interpret the um, variable importance graph. So this was from a random forest. Mm -hmm. And it's showing the percent increase in MSE if the variables randomly permuted, permuted, and then uh, you can see all the variables. So using non-technical language, interpret the following importance output that came from Random Forest. Uh, make recommendations for a property manager who wants to find the most profitable apartments to invest in. You want me to take an, uh, an exam right now? Is that what you're trying to say? Yes, I, I want you to take a swing <laughs> at answering this question. Uh, I think what I'll do is I'm not going to write seven sentences right now. Okay, just in you just but what I explain it, yeah. But what I would say is, um, you know, typically variance important graphs they're very helpful. People will sometimes have a threshold associated with it. In this particular case, um, it seems like it's quite dominated by what is the price per square foot, and so as a result, what I would want to have a better understanding of is what were the other types of models used, because when you have one variable that is dominant, then I have to wonder, is random forest even the right solution? The reason why is, uh, if you see this here and you see that the vast majority of the variance is explained, well, by the first three or four variables, it suggests to me that you might be able to have a linear regression model, which includes the main effect terms, interaction terms and maybe polynomial terms, and you might actually be able to explain as much or more variance than what you've done here with one, one third to one fourth as many variables. So that was my quick, quick take. But I'm not using, I'm, I'm purposely uh, not uh, using non-technical language because I'm not taking the exam right now. Yes, that's the key. Um, so what Howard said is absolutely right. If he were taking the exam, he would have gotten a terrible grade on that question. He would have flunked the test. 
Um, and that sort of illustrates the point that you can be statistically right in everything you say, but not get credit because you're not following the instruction. So it's just really important that you do exactly what they want to say. Um, like this is a model example would be, you know, our model identifies the key drivers of rental demand. The following graph shows the relative influence at each characteristic of the apartment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I already talked about these yesterday, but it's, you know, basically, you know, keep all the statistics in your head, but then sort of simplify it and just do exactly what the question asks you to do. So to Sam's point on that, um, when you're grading and when exams are being graded, most people have a checklist and they're, you know, if it's, Assuming that this is manually graded or if it's automatic, I promise you, it's literally going across checklists. Did you do A? Did you do B? Did you do C? Did you do D? If so, you get this many points. Yeah, and that was actually a perfect segue. This wasn't staged, I promise. Um, but, but our next part is going to be doing that. So uh, here you can see uh, the, a graded example. So this was from um, one of the one of our people, one of the people in our in our group here, one of our audience members asked um, this question, and uh, they were comparing their answer to my answer, and also like the official graded solution. Um, so this is the question. It was worth you know twelve percent of the exam, uh, and it says construct a boosted decision tree. Explain what boosting does and why it might be considered useful for this problem. And so, just like Howard said the grader would just create a checklist like this. It'd say, okay, each of these bullet points is going to be worth three points. Uh, you know, the second, and then the second point is plot the partial pendants. The next part is plot the tree, et cetera. So we can look at these two answers. I'm going to call this person Joe for the sake of anonymity. And then this was my official answer from our video solution. Um, so this first part um, was perfect. Uh, Joe uh, explains what a GBM is very concisely. Uh, and then uh, there's one, one improvement, I would say, is just the word choice. So in Microsoft Word, if you just look at the little blue underline, it will tell you when you can use a better word. Um, my question was a little bit long-winded. Uh, so I say, I start by sort of rambling about, oh, it's important to consider the business application, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I wouldn't take points off of that because you can't really take points off for being too long but it would cost me a lot of time. So I wouldn't have as much time in other questions. And the next part, um, I lost three points and I would say Joe would lose one point here. Um, so Joe says, I ran a GBM with 1000 trees, a shrinkage of 0 0.001, two variables with the highest relative influence were our and temp. So I use these in the partial dependence plot right here. Um, I completely misinterpreted this question because uh, I was looking at, um, so the project statement said, uh, here it is, plot the partial dependence for each of the two most important factors. So I read factors as like a factor variable, as like a categorical variable. And so I was looking at, um, you know, these two graphs, year and weekday, um, when the real question was asking for hour and temperature. Uh, Joe did a great job of pointing out this flat region here. Uh, he says the partial dependence plot shows the marginal effect of the variable on the target. So the top graph for hours showing when the hour is around 7 to 18, and it drives a predicted value of bikes per hour. Uh, when the hour is between 0 and 5, very few people are riding their bikes. That's right here. Uh, similarly, the bottom graph shows that the comfortable warm temperature between 0 0.6 and 0 0.8 drive up high bike value uses. But when it's very cold, less than 0 0.0, hardly anyone rides. Um, and so uh, on, on my answer, I, I actually explained a partial dependence plot for a factor variable, which is actually quite difficult to do because this is really you know, binary. You only have a 0 or a 1. Um, but you know, just because Joe had a good answer doesn't mean that he couldn't have a better answer. Here's how you could improve. Uh, you could just change the tense. Uh, or the, the perspective from, uh, so it's a partial dependence plots show the marginal effect of the variable on the target, adjusting for all other variables in the model. The top graph shows that when hour is around seven or 18. So um, to make this easier to read, you can use a bold on your variable names. 
uh, and the expected value of bikes per hour increases. When hours between zero and five, very few people ride their bikes. Um, similarly, the bottom graph shows the warm temperatures between 19.8 degrees Celsius and 29.4 degrees Celsius. So that was just converting the, um, the normalized temperature values to the actual temperature values so that's easier to read. So right now, I would say that Joe has 11 out of 12 points, and, I, and my answer only has nine. Um, and then, yeah, in total, the grader would look at all of these bullet points, and they'd say, okay, three out of three, two out of three, three out of three, uh, and then assign the, the grade for that question. And a grader is just going to be like a, an assembly line. They're just going to look at the same question over hundreds and hundreds of people so that they can be as consistent as possible. So that's why it's really important to follow exactly what the uh, model solution is saying. Um, now I'm just going to sort of Sam, pause. Uh, I'm just going to come off uh, you to say goodbye. Wish everyone the best of luck. Yeah. So terrific. And best of luck with the exam. Thank you, Howard. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, so now we're just going to go to uh, more of the exam focus questions that um, all of you have asked. Uh, so we, we do have about another more than an hour to go. So if you have any questions before then, uh, we might even be able to sneak those in at the very end. Uh, the first question is about candidate IDs. Are we allowed to write down our candidate IDs on a sheet of paper and bring that into the exam? Also, I say something about including our candidate IDs in the names of the word in RMD files, but should we have them anywhere else uh, in a comment in the RMD header or Word doc? Yeah, uh, so every in every file you submit, you need to include the candidate ID. There will be a spot in the Word in RMD files. Um, you can get your candidate ID from the uh, SOA website. If you just Google that, there's a link there. Um, you you get it in your email it, it, when you when you like register for the ProMetric exam. Uh, question about exam time. Uh, I was wondering what happens on the exam if your time runs out as you're writing the summary. Also, how much time should I allocate to uploading? So you have uh, nine minutes at the beginning. You're going to uh, walk into the Prometric. You're going to check your ID. Uh, they're going to you know, give you headphones, um, a pen, the printed project statement, and then you're going to sit down and you'll go through this, the Prometric tutorial. Uh, you can also read the project statement at that time. It's a good idea just to skim over it. Um, and then you, then the clock starts and you have five hours and 15 minutes to uh, work on the exam. Files can't be uploaded until you get to the upload time, which is five minutes at the end. It's a good idea to save your Word file. Just press Control S and save your RMD file as you go. Um, and if you do you know, for some reason, delete part of your file, or you need to go back to get a fresh copy, you can re-download download that. Um, and when you get to the end, you can just skip the survey and just, you know, get out of there. You've already been there for like more than five hours. Uh, next question is interpreting uh, logit or probit coefficients. Um, so the short answer, so I was wondering if you can help me better understand how to interpret the model's coefficients when using a binomial or logit or probit link functions. I noticed in the hospital readmissions task eight solution, you were able to code this up in our studio. When reviewing the SOA solution, they made a comment that this can also be done in Excel. See below of the SOA's coefficients for the probit link function, as well as their interpretation table. Can you give me an example of how this would be done in Excel for both the logit and the probit link functions? Uh, yes. Um, so I did go through this in Excel. Um, and, and the way it works is for a GLM, you know, you, you have the mean of this response, which is uh, related to the, the, um, the linear predictor, which is the product of all the um, coefficients times the, uh, the variables. And that's uh, related by a link function. And so for like logit, you have the log odds. And so you need to inverse that function. And for probit, that's a, um, an inverse standard normal or, or Gaussian CDF. And so you just invert that by using the Gaussian CDF. 
And so in Excel, um, it would look like this. So uh, you, you, you need to have a, a single observation. So like, let's say you're predicting um, a, a, a specific person, whether or not they'll be readmitted. And so these are the coefficients and then these are the values. And then the linear predictor is the product, the sum product of these. And then the survival probability is e to the z over one plus e to the z. And then for a probit link, you can use this norm.dist function in Excel. Just be careful that you use this uh, true statement at the end, which uses a, uh, a cumulative distribution as opposed to the, like the PDF. So it uses the CDF as opposed to the PDF. Um, now, I wasn't actually able to match these values exactly here, like 0 0.09855. Uh, I really couldn't figure that out. I spent like 20 minutes uh, looking at it. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Um, I, I would just reproduce the SOA's code again, but it's, it's from an old exam from like 2019. And so um, I need to update my version of R before I can do that. But um, on your exam, you shouldn't have that difficulty. It is just a simple formula. It's just that e to the x over 1 plus e to the x to go from logit. And then uh, the, the, the norm.dist function for the probit. Uh, this was just another question um, about, um, this is from an old exam. You know, this is from the student success exam, which is like one of the earliest examples. Um, but I wanted to give it to you because um, it is something that could come up, um, which is related to feature engineering. So, um, so let's say you're given like, you know, these different, um, so in, in this exam, you know, you, you were asked to just create different features and they created uh, their, these features um, daily. So what the problem is, is that you're looking at students, like uh, high school students, and you're predicting whether or not they're going to pass their end of semester grade. And you look at like their age, uh, how, how often they, what their, what their hobbies are, how often they uh, go out with friends, if they drink alcohol, uh, and so forth, uh, their mother and father's education, and so forth. And the question is just um, come up with some new features. And um, if they do ask you a question like this, there's a lot of different things you can do. Like you can multiply the two variables together. So, uh, and this is because alcohol consumption may be compounding. So if, and so if you have two variables uh, and, you know, if one is higher, then it, then it makes the other one, you know, have a, more of an impact. Or in other words, that's just an interaction effect. Um, then you can multiply the two together. Uh, same thing with mother's and father's education, right? They just multiply them together. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of other things that you could do. Um, uh, the next, so uh, this is the actual SOA's answer. I noticed that, uh, uh, actually, no. So this is another question, uh, another another uh, audience audience question. Uh, I noticed that in June 16, 2020, uh, patient's length of stay, the project statement explicitly said to interpret the original GLM and not the lasso GLM. My question is as follows. If we binarize data and run lasso, we will drop some feature levels. An example from this exam was only a few age buckets were included as significant and the other binarized variables were dropped. Let's say, you know, zero to 20, 20 to 40 and so forth. But if we ultimately use this GLM as a final model and go to interpret the coefficients for Poisson with log link, it is appropriate to say the base level for the intercept is any age that is not specifically included in the model. For example, 40 to 50, 50 to 60, 70 to 80. For example, if age bucket is zero to 20 and there is a multiplicative impact in the intercept of X beta. First of all, this is a really good question because it demonstrates that you understand a lot of things. You understand the GLM, the lasso, binarization, uh, variable interactions, and also um, binning, which is uh, when you put the variable into bins. So the easiest way to uh, explain this would just be to look at a little example. 
So let's say you had, you know, age, and this is like just a number. Um, so for each person, you know, this is Bob, this is Sam, this is Sue, this is Mary, you know what their age is. And when you create the, the, um, the indicator variables, um, you're going to say, you know, a new variable, which is age 10, age 30, age, let's just keep it at two. So for this person, it's one and then zero. And then for this person, it's zero, oops, and then one, right? And so, um, so first of all, you, you create these binary uh, values, but you know that um, if you put, um, so let's say you fit like a linear model that was just, you know, um, y follows age 10, right? So that will only need um, two coefficients. It will have the intercept beta zero plus beta one x one. And this is x one. So it's beta one times age 10. So this will just be um, zero or one. So like if the reference level, if the, if the base factor level for this age 10 value, value um, is zero, that would be people who aren't age 10, then um, you know, this, this will not make an impact except when the person is age 10, then there would be the coefficient added. Um, but when you, when you do binning, you're actually doing something even more complicated. So like, let's say you, you're creating bins like age 10 to 20, uh, age 20 to 30, age 30 to 40. Um, so this is one zeros. This is um, all zeros, one zero. This one, 30 to 40. Uh, we'll have to assume that this is like, um, you know, not inclusive of 30. Okay, so now you'd have these, these variables. So you could put, you could fit a model like this. Y is age 20, 10 to 20 plus age 20 to 30 plus age 30 to 40. Uh, and, and these variables would be binary predictor variables. So each one of them would have a base level, um, which would either be zero or one. It would most likely be zero because that's where the, um, you know, most people are not going to be in that bucket. Um, and so then if you fit a lasso, you might get um, like a simpler result. So like, let's say you, this is your model. And then after lasso, you remove this first one. So then you just have this model. So it's just age 20 to 30, age 30 to 40. Um, and so at that point, uh, if a person isn't in age 20 or 30 or in age 30 to 40, then you can infer that they have to be in age you know, you know, zero to 10 or 40 plus, right? So the, that would be, um, that would be the reference level. Um, so yeah, so I, you know, ideally, um, you know, your reference level is always going to be the one that has the most observations, but if the project statement tells you to use a specific algorithm or to do things in a certain, in certain steps like this, um, then you just have to follow what the project statement's telling you to do. Uh, let me just stop the screen share so I can read the chat. Okay. Uh, thanks. Can you please also explain log and identity? Yeah. 
So um, log, log link function is, you know, log, um, let me see. Log link function, uh, identity is the easiest. Identity just says that the mean of your target is your linear predictor. So let's see if I can do this. Uh, screen share, whiteboard. So for identity, you just say that y is equal to beta zero plus beta one x one. And so like, let's say um, your family is, is, uh, you know, gamma and your link is just identity i, then it means that you have, um, for each person, you have a gamma distribution and the mean of that gamma right here is just equal to that beta zero plus beta one x1 uh, and then for log uh, if you had so if, so if you have a log link then it means that your mean the log of the mean is equal to beta zero plus beta one x1 so therefore uh, if you take the exponent of both sides the mean is the exponent beta one x one. So um, does that make sense? Is that is that answering your question? So to interpret, you know, your coefficients, but let's say you had, um, you know, x one, x two. Oh well, no, let me. Uh, I think that I think that that answers your question. Let me know in the chat if that doesn't, because we've seen a lot of those examples. We've seen a lot of interpretations of log link functions. You can just look at some of the old practice exams. I think so. Oh, can you explain the canonical link? Is the logit function the only canonical link? No. So uh, the canonical link function comes from the GLM theory. Um, I don't remember the formula right now, but there's this... Um, screen share. There's this formula that every, every distribution that you use comes from the exponential family, which means that the PDF can be written using a, a specific, um, a specific formula. It's like, you know, like a PDF is a probability density function, like, um, for the, you know, a binomial, the, the PDF is like n choose k, you know, x to the n one minus x to the n minus k. That's the PDF. Um, and the, when you're working with an exponential distribution, it's like the gamma, the inverse ga gamma, the Gaussian, the binomial. It means that you can write it using like this... Um, function of exponentials it's like e to the a of x plus b of you know x times c or something like that i'm just making up that formula and then each of these components a b and c um when they're set to different values results in different um distributions like if you set this part to zero you just get an exponential random variable, you know? And um, the canonical link function is the mathematical, um, so it's, it's, it's the most convenient way of choosing these values. Um, so it, depending on the family. So like, it's, it's basically theoretical, um, but the theor theory um, helps the algorithm to converge most often. So it, it makes your modeling um, faster to fit. Like if you look at the GLM output, it will tell you the number of iterations that it took to converge. And when you use the, the canonical link, often it will be, um, 
faster when you use that. Um, but it's not a requirement, you know, in data science, there's the best model is the one that works the best. Um, so you, 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 you use it as a, as info, but don't make all of your decisions based on it. Always look at the training error and the testing error, the AIC and the BIC. Um, is the logit function the only canonical link? No. So um, like different families have different canonical links. Um, in R, if you type in question mark um, GLM or question mark family, it will show you the, the, uh, the link functions for each family. Like for um, gamma, it's the log link. For Gaussian, it's the identity link. For logit, it's the, um, the log log odds, you know, the, the, uh, for the binomial family, it's the, uh, the logit link and so forth. Uh, let me know if you have other questions. I'm just going to keep, keep moving on here. We do have more. Um, yeah, I was just going to talk about um, model selection. No, no, what was the slide? Okay, well, well, let's just finish up this question. So my question was, uh, we, we did three things. First, we, we, put the, we put the age variable into bins, and then we binarized each of the um, bin values. So we, we added dummy, dummy columns or indicator columns. Um, and then you use this a lasso. Or you could use uh, stepwise selection in order to remove some bins that are not significant. Um, if we ultimately use this GLM as the final model and go to interpret the coefficients for Poisson with log link, is it appropriate to say the base level is the intercept of any age that is not specifically included in the model? Uh, um, I wouldn't say that. that, that that's kind of a, um, a big leap. I would just explain your process step by step. Um, yeah, so that is, uh, so does anyone else have any other questions right now? Or would you like me to go through, um, you know, other examples? Like I could go through that, um, I can go through examples from our, our latest exams, um, or uh, I could, you know, just, just uh, open up a practice exam and start working. Uh, we did book this webinar for another hour, and I'm just, you know, so uh, I'll just keep going. Okay, how about I will just go through um, one of the one of our practice exams. I'm just going to show show you how I would conduct a practice test if I were if I were retaking this exam. Uh, so I'll go to our form formulas our folder. All right, let's do um, let's do this bike sharing demand exam. So first of all, I just need the template files. So just make a copy of this. And that's not working because it's making a copy. Okay, we're gonna try a different one. Uh, you do have another question. Okay. In one of the practice tests, hours, uh, in one of the practice tests, hours were handled as numeric. I decided in my answer to make them factors. Is there a good guideline on when to make something numeric um, or factor? Uh, yes, there is. Um, if you can compare the two values, um, like if you can measure the thing, like, let's say you're looking at, um, well, let me, let me say that again. So when should you make a variable numeric and when should you make it a factor? Well, that, that question is, is context specific because it's asking you about 
for a decision tree versus for a GLM. Um, but in general, um, if the variable is a number, like it's something you're measuring, then it should be a number in, in like a numeric type. If it's like a category, like let's say it's weekday and they've coded the values, you know, Sunday is equal to one, Monday is equal to two. Obviously that should be a category. Um, and even better, you can rename the, the variable uh, levels to be one is equal to Sunday, two is equal to Monday. So when you fit your GLM, it's easier to read. Um, if, you, if you do like bin the variable, then you can make it a factor. Like in the age example from earlier, you know, you, you're gonna have different bins for age one, age 10 to 20 and so forth. Uh, the reason that we do that um, is because it can uh, reduce the likelihood of overfitting. Um, and like in, in insurance pricing, for instance, um, you, you typically would just include bins for ranges of the variable that have a lot of observations. Like if you're, you're, you're modeling patients and everyone is, you know, between, you know, 18 to 65, uh, and you only have a few people who are between 18 to 30, you could just put all of them into one bin. Um, and and so, so the reason why they do that is because um, it allows you to interpret the result using relativities or, or um, you know, when you, when you take a log link for a GLM, you can just look at the exponent of the coefficients and then break that down into just a bunch of numbers that are multiplied together. So that just makes a very simple list of rules. So you can say, oh, you're in, you're, you're a minor. So that's, you know, plus a hundred dollars per member per month in your premiums. Oh, you're over 65. That means you have to pay this amount more, you know, each month. So to, to summarize, there's no uh, single guideline. It depends on the question, uh, what they're asking. Uh, in your opinion, do you think the new SOA changes related to R code will really cut back on the amount of code they provide? What areas do you think we should definitely memorize related to R code? Um, I would say just look over the, uh, the modules. Um, look over the... Um, Look over the SOA's modules. Let's see if I can just open that right now. I don't remember. Um, so just look over the modules and look at the uh, the sort of the snippets that they provide to you, um, which are which are always the same for the practice exams. Like you'll notice that you know when you're doing like data visualization. They're going to give you like all the ggplot things, you know, to create like, um, like the big like facet of like they show you like all the histograms and all of the line plots and things. Um, like when they have a for loop, you know, you don't have to worry about that. They're not going to make you write anything in a for loop. Um, they're also not going to um, expect you to know dplyr. So anywhere you see these, um, the pipe operators, you know, you don't need to learn that. Um, but like when you're doing um, like data manipulation, like adding variables, removing variables, um, filtering out observations, you should be able to do all of that from scratch. Um, and from scratch, I mean, by, by using their, their template code. Um, so a good exercise to do is, um, our data, data exercise, data prep exercise. Uh, you go through that, and uh, you know, try to try to just use their their code snippets. So I forget where this is. It's in like week four. Data exploration right here. Um, so you don't have to use the code that I give here. You can just use this uh, as a starting point. and copy and paste in the code from like another practice exam when you're like creating these graphs uh, or making changes. Uh, th so this part is the exercise. That, that, this is just the lesson. This is the actual uh, sort of exercise. And then you can compare um, the result. 
you know, and when you compare the result, don't try to match everything verbatim because there's an, there are other ways that you could explain things. You could use a line graph, you could use a scatter plot, or you could use a, um, in, in some cases, you could use a different type of graph, or you could just look at summary statistics or use an Excel table. You, you don't, sometimes you don't even need to use a graph. Should we automatically transform all character variables to factors? Yes, that's my personal opinion. Um, but don't just break the code. You know, if you see that they do something in the template, just kind of leave it because they'll probably fix it later on. So if you just make a change at the beginning, you might have to go through and make that same change like a million different times. So just, you know, don't make a change unless they, they sort of tell you to. Um, and should we re-level at the beginning of the exam if we see that there is a GLM question later? Or even if they don't explicitly tell us to do this? Um, I would say no. If they don't tell you to do it, um, don't do it. That, that, because uh, they, they, you could spend time you know, re-leveling, and then they tell you to drop that variable altogether, and you just wasted your time. Um, but it's good that you can write that. So even if you don't do something, you can say in your report, oh, by the way, I know that I should have re-leveled these variables, but the project statement didn't tell me to. Because you can just write to the exam grading team. Unless they tell you to write to the audience, you know, you're just writing to the, gra to the grader. You're just writing an email to the actuary who's grading your exam. Uh, and one of the practice tests, ours are handled as numeric. I decided on my answers to make them factors. Okay. Um, is it a good guideline on when to make something a numeric or fact? We already answered that question. Uh, in your opinion, um, do you think the new SOA changes related to R code will really cut back on the amount? We already answered that question too. Uh, if we don't know the answer to a question with the exam being graded relative to other test takers, is it better to try a BS and answer and leave it blank? Or how do you think we should approach that? Um, definitely don't leave anything blank. You, um, at the same time, um, you're not graded based on the number of words that you write. You're graded based on how well you answer their questions. So you can have a shorter answer that answers, that, that gives them everything that they want. Um, so I would say, um, just do your best and explain your process. Like, let's just imagine that I took the exam and I completely forgot what the difference was between bagging and boosting. And the question said, explain the difference between bagging and boosting. <laughs> I would just try to, um, write everything that I know. Like I know that, um, random forests use bagging and I know that GBMs use boosting. And I could say, oh, well, a random forest um, has fewer hyperparameters. It only has n tree and m tri parameters, whereas a GBM has more parameters like the learning rate, the number of trees, the subsample percentage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so you could say, oh, one difference between bagging and boosting models is that uh, in random forests, aka bagged models, uh, there are fewer parameters and that's not wrong. <laughs> it's just not complete. Right. So I would at least get like one point on, on that. Um, well, and also uh, just kind of leave it empty and then keep going through the exam and you might refresh your mind um, when you, when you get to the end, they might even give you a free cookie at the end. They say, Oh, uh, you know, this is the difference between bagging and boosting, you know, in the end of the exam and you can just, use that earlier. Uh, will we ever have to calculate or interpreting the entropy uh, for a decision tree? And if so, if so uh, how do we go about doing that? Uh, great question. Uh, yeah, we do. Um, in, the, uh, in the SOA modules, uh, they do have this really complicated uh, example where they, they make you calculate it. I remember doing that. Uh, I don't expect that it would be that difficult on the real exam. Uh, if they did ask you, I think it would be more of, 
you know, fit a decision tree that used Gini and then fit a decision tree that uses entropy. And then, um, you know, explain what some of the differences are. Um, the answer is uh, you basically need to fit both models and see which ones performs the best. Um, and you, what you don't use as a splitting criteria is the, the accuracy, um, because that's not a, it's not sensitive enough to decide on which splits are good and which splits are bad. So uh, if you look at our, our trees lesson video, um, I do go through a simple example like this. Um, so to, to sort of summarize, I won't even summarize this because I, I don't want to take up time. You can just watch this video and, and see how to calculate the, uh, the Gini and the entropy for a uh, tree. Uh, what are your thoughts on making edits, if asked, to the data in Excel if I'm really struggling with making the changes in R? Uh, I remember that, Tom. I, I do remember you're, you're asking me that question. Do you think the SOA would greatly penalize this? My thought is at least it would allow me to do the modeling and perhaps still pass. Um, I don't think so, um, simply because it's part of what they're testing. They, they, they expect you to learn R, and so that's what they want you to do. Uh, you, you, if you did use Excel, um, you wouldn't have a way of it being graded. You know, you'd have to go into Excel, um, make the changes, and then export as a CSV file, and then import the CSV file into R. Um, but CSV files don't have any way of showing like the steps involved. So the grader would just look at your data and just think that you just didn't do anything. Um, and, and they also wouldn't be able to reproduce it. When they do grade your exam, they're going to run your RMD file from beginning to end, and they're going to expect that the outputs will match what you pasted into your report. So you can't cheat by just making up numbers on your report, or, or they would catch that. Um, so the good news is that um, we do have a lot of practice uh, for the data manipulation. Um, so if you just look on the, like that exercise I showed earlier, um, that will help you. Um, yeah, and, and you know, if you do feel like you know, there's absolutely no way that I can pass uh, if I'm taking the exam the, um, this time, um, that, that's okay, because they're gonna give you feedback. They tell you which areas you did well on. They give you, they tell you, okay, you did uh, you know, well on, you got like four out of five points on data prep. You got um, five out of five points on modeling, five out of five on selection. And so that when you retake the exam, you know what you need to focus on. So yeah, I would say just go for it, you know, do the best that you can. Um, and, and, and it'll just help you become more familiar with the, with the material. And you've also already paid for it, right? So it's $1,200. doesn't make sense to just throw that away. Uh, if you had to guess, and I know this is really a stretch, is dependent on a lot of factors. How many points do you think it takes to score a six on the upcoming exam? Uh, I think if you're asking that question, <laughs> you should just be focusing on studying because um, that's a moving target. Um, if everyone on the exam scored a 90, then the pass mark would be a 95, right? The points are arbitrary. Um, it, it, so it, they, they, they want the pass rate to stay consistent. Uh, they're not grading it based on the number of points. I'm obviously going to try my best. Yes, try your best. Absolutely. <laughs> give, it, give it the best try that you can. Uh, as Yoda would say, do or do not, there is no try. So don't even say that you're gonna try, say that you're going to pass, right? Have that positive affirmation and then go do it. And uh, if you need to, and you are going to pass, right? You're not gonna, maybe you won't pass this time, but you'll pass next time. Uh, thank you, write something like time. Where the 24 hour is not, wait, I'm sorry. This is a kind of, thank you, write for something like time where the 24th hour is not 24 times the first hour. Oh, I think you're, are you talking about factor variables versus numeric variables? In that case, yes. Like let's say your, your, your input is time. And it's like bins, like 1 a.m. to 3 a.m., 1, 4 a.m. to 6 a.m., 2. Um, 
it would be better if you kept that as a factor. I agree. How do you expect questions to be set up with the summary being, in the, being within the question? Will there be a way for bullets telling you what to do and anything the last bullet would say, something like summarize the first three bullets in a non-technical way? That, uh, that's a good question. And yes, that, that's a very good example. Um, they might ask you to do something and then have you summarize it. And I think it was the, the, uh, one of the 2020 exams, they say, summarize the data for your actuarial manager in like task three. So in task ones and two, you went through and you create some histograms and uh, clean the data, remove some records, maybe apply to log transform, and then summarize it using non-technical language. So you'd say like, we wanted to be completely sure that our data was free of any irregularities or errors. We looked at the visual, the data, we looked at both visual summaries and statistics in order to uh, ensure that we, we were looking at every uh, dimension um, possible. You know, and then like, here's a very simple graph, you know, that shows the distribution of the target variable. And you might show like a simple histogram, make sure that you add a lot of uh, labels, make it very easy to read. And then, um, you know, just now write, write as if you were writing, you know, to a sales manager. Uh, and bullet points are great, by the way. Yeah, bullet points, that's faster to read. You know, it, and it helps the grader. Uh, the, like Howard was saying, um, he, he grades a lot of academic papers and, and a lot of academic tests, and he, he likes to see organization. So you can use like subheadings uh, where you like make one heading bold and then, you know, put a little paragraph and then another subheading and then like bullet points. Yes, that's great. If a question says to explain loadings on PCA, or create a GLM and evaluate it. Should I explain what a PCA or GLM is uh, or just answer what's asked? <laughs> I honestly struggle with this too um, because sometimes um, I, I do explain things when I don't really need to. I think that's because I'm sort of just in a teaching mindset. So I just sort of look at everything and say, oh, I need to explain this. I need to explain this because I'm creating tutorial videos. But you are not. You're just answering what the what the question says. Um, it's always good if you can uh, show that you know something, because even if you're wrong, you can still get partial credit for it. Um, like if I tell you, if you ask me, okay, you know, fit a PCA to this data, you know, and then choose and then, and then tell me what the the best principal component is, and I'll say A, you know, A is the A is the answer. And then I grade that and say, no, it's B, you know, zero points. Uh, whereas if you say, oh, well, principal component analysis is a dimensionality reduction technique where you take an original set of variables and transform it into a new dimension, thus uh, removing variables or thus combining variables that are highly correlated into a new principal component where the loadings or weights of each principal component uh, give you a recipe so that you can take the initial variables and then translate them into the new uh, coordinate space. Uh, like if you say that and then say, oh, by the way, the answer is B. Um, oh, that was wrong, but you still got partial credit for the first explanation. So it's sort of a way of just padding your answers. Uh, next question. I have trouble identifying interactions for box plots. Can you give me more guide guidance? Something the box plot looks similar, but the solution says there is an interaction. It is hard to tell. Um, yeah, it is. Uh, let's just try drawing a, drawing a picture. Um, you don't need to look at a box plot, by the way. Um, Box plots are just what the SOA happened to use in like the June exams. And so that's what we've sort of copied. Um, you can also look at like facets. 
So here's the cheat sheets. So like here, um, so, you know, if you have numeric, if you have, so what type of box bot are you talking? So I, I, I let me rephrase that. So when you're looking at a factor and a factor interaction, then um, a box bot uh, is useful, but you could also look at just a, a lot of histograms. Like, let's say, how do I clear this? There it is. Um, like you're looking at two variables, okay? Day or night, and then hot or cold. Okay, so you could just you know look at the um the all the combinations. So you day cold day night. Uh, and no, that's not right. That doesn't even make sense. Day hot. Night. Night. Hot, uh, cold, hot, and then uh, let's say you're just looking at the histograms, and uh, this will be no interaction, and this will be yes. So if there was no interaction, then the only this only one variable would make a difference. So it'd just be day. Um, so it'd just be, um, so when it's, when it's daylight, you know, you'd have this distribution. These would both be the same. And then when it's night, you might have like this distribution. And if there was an interaction then you'd have different distributions for each one, like this will look like this, this will look like that, this will look like that. This will look like that, right? So it's just a way of looking at the dimensions. Um, and does that answer? I think that answers your question. When you look at the box plot, it's just another way of showing you the distribution. So in R, um, the way you can do that is using facet wrap. So you do like geom histogram and then facet wrap, you know, vers is equal to uh, day and night. Because um, yeah, I think in facet, you can use multiple variables. You can do like facet wrap day comma night. Uh, I know I should never take a log transform of the target variable, but I recall reading an SOA solution for the first couple of tasks on data exploration. They compared the log of the target to the predictor variables. Do you recommend doing this? Um, yeah, I, I know, I, th I do remember that. I think it's in um, the traffic safety exam from the PA June, 2019. Um, we were, the target is like crash score, which is a continuous uh, positive value. And um, when they're looking at the histogram, they say, this is right skewed. But when we apply the log transform, you can see that the graph straightens out. Um, and they just do that to the, to the histogram. Then when you fit the GLM, uh, they use a log link function on the untransformed variable. Uh, but what you don't want to do is transform something um, you know, using, using an inferior method. That, you know, using a log transform is what you used to do before you knew what a GLM was. Before you knew that you had a log link function where you could relate your linear predictor to your target using that um, additional function, uh, you used to rely on the primitive version of just transforming the target. Um, um, and also there's an example in, um, 
in one of the late exams where you transform the output of a decision tree. Um, I think that was in the either pedestrian activity or bike sharing, um, where they ask you to look at the square root transform, the square transform, the log transform, and uh, and the way that you you choose that is you just look at the histograms, and you choose the one that makes the distribution more symmetric. Um, that's because in a decision tree, uh, you, at the, when you get to the end leaf node, you end up taking an average of all the values in a bucket. So if your uh, variable is very uh, skewed, you know you're, that um, taking a mean is sensitive to to the the skewness. Um, so the mean will be skewed in the same way that the data is. So when you apply the transform to the data and then fit the decision tree and then take the mean at each of the leaf nodes, uh, it, it, it's, it's this, this, the predictions are better. Uh, can you go over how to interpret PCA loadings or just how to read a biplot? Yes, I can do that. So So we do have this example um, from the um, from the from the, the the cheat sheet. So um, so the way to read this is that, a and B, so, so, so here you see uh, PC1 and PC2. So if you were, um, so the way that this was created was you had data like this. You had, uh, A, B, C, D. Oops. So these are just numbers. And then you wanted to go from, um, so then you would run PCA and you get four PCs, PC1, PC2, PC3, PC4. And uh, you know, these would also just be numbers, except they would be um, their principal components so that uh, so there, there'll be linear combinations of A, B, C, and D. And if you want to reduce the dimension, you can just choose like the first two, or you could choose the first three, right? So, um, so that's what these are. So like, let's say that, uh, you know, these vectors E and A were um, almost, uh, what's the word for it? Not uh, adjacent or uh, they're, they're completely uncor uncorrelated or uh, orthogonal. Now orthogonal is 90 degrees. I'm not sure what the word is for that. So it would be like negative. So like E is almost equal to like negative A. Um, then, you know, that would be like, oh, there, there's an E here. And there's like an E. This would be like approximately negative A. Or like, it, 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 think of it in terms of like, um, Practical cases, if you're like talking about A being temperature and E being snowfall, you know that when the temperature is high, the snowfall is going to be low and vice versa. So they have a negative correlation, right? Uh, so it would be something like that. And then B and C 
uh, B and C, these two, so green and red would be, um, would be orthogonal. So that means that they would be uncorrelated. So let's say your snowfall and um, the amount of coffee that I drank that morning, right? There's just no relationship between them. And then D and B would be like, um, you know, the red and the yellow. These would be like positively correlated. Like let's say it's, um, let's say it's, um, you're looking at claims. It's, you know, the person's age and their annual cost. As they get older, they, they are more expensive. Does that sort of answer your questions? Uh, I think we do have we do have some examples of PC of principal component analysis in our exams. Um, I want to say it's like the the traffic safety exam. I think it's principal component analysis. Um, if you if you look through our so if you look through our our older exams and then look at the tags underneath the video solution, uh, you can see. Or you can just type in the search principal component analysis into our website and it should bring up the practice exams that have that. Uh, do you think quasi Poisson or quasi binomial distributions will ever be needed or appear? Great question. Uh, that is on the syllabus, although they have never appeared on the exam. Um, so the way to test that is to look at the mean and the variance. If the mean, so for a Poisson distribution, remember you have one parameter, lambda, and lambda is equal to the mean and the variance. So if you look at your target's mean and your target's variance and they're radically different, then that means you need to use an over-dispersed Poisson, uh, or, or rather the quasi-Poisson. And then uh, for the binomial, um, <laughs> Uh, you, you, you know that like the, t the mean is just P and the variance is P times one minus P, right? So you can just look at the mean and then take the mean times one minus the mean. Uh, and I think you should get to the variance. And, and if that doesn't work, then it means you need to use the quasi binomial. Uh, and everything should be tested. You should have a training set and a test set. You should fit both models and then look at the Performance, the the AIC, the root mean squared error, the log likelihood, you know, whatever it is that you're you're using. If yes, can you give a quick description of these um, and when they would be used? Um, yes, I can. Uh, I think there was actually an example. Uh, I'm trying to hunt it down, but I did I did like have a. A, a hypothetical answer where I was thinking, how could I do that? Uh, let me see if I can find it. If I can't find it right now in the next like five seconds, I'll email it. I'll email it and put it in the forms. Um, but it was for the it was for the the um, pedestrian activity, right? Because you're counting the number of pedestrians in an hour, um, so you can try just fitting the quasi Poisson to that data, you know, and just add another model and then look at the performance. Is the AIC better or worse? It's a good question. Should we rebalance classes if not asked to do so? Um, so, uh, so I summarize, you know, re rebalancing classes is because, you know, your, your classes are, are imbalanced, um, meaning that there's more in one class than another. Let's say, you are modeling uh, loan defaults, you know, and most of your loans 
don't have a, most of your loans are, are fine. They're not going to default. And only like 10% of them are at a risk to default. Um, if you just trained your model on that data, then the model will be good at identifying loans that are safe, but it won't have many examples of loans that are false. Um, and so if you end up just training your model, it will just predict that all loans are safe. And so you need to use rebalancing. Um, so the way that you do that is um, you can oversample the, uh, the number of defaulting loans, or you can undersample the number of the safe loans. Um, there's also another technique. It's not on this exam. It's called SMOAT, synthetically minor majority oversampling technique. Um, I think that this exam just uses over and undersampling. Um, and you use the, the carrot library to do that. Um, that's never appeared on an exam before. Um, but what you do check is that the percentage of the mean target is the same in your training set and in your test set. So yeah, yeah. if they don't ask you to do it, um, I, I, I don't think it's necessary, uh, but definitely comment on that. Um, and, and, and when you get to fit your model, you know, say that, or uh, in the executive summary, there used to be a section where you talk about future considerations or next steps. Um, if you have a question like that, where they, they can ask you, what would you do differently if you could repeat this analysis and you are working on a, an imbalanced class, you could say we could rebalance the classes. Ha, weights and offsets are the worst. I know you went over this in the apartments practice exam, can you run through when to use an offset versus a weight? Yes, uh, I wouldn't say that they're the worst. I would say that um, they can be confusing. Um, but really, once you look at this, you'll see that it's actually very straightforward. Um, so a weight is your measure of exposure. And an offset is just a is a constant is a constant term. Um, so, um, how do I think about this? So, like, um, you you all know how to take like a weighted um, average. Like you have you know, your, your vector W, which is your weights and your vector uh, X. So like, if you want to take the expected value of X, it's, you know, the sum of weights times X over the sum of the weights. And um, for a GLM, oh, well, I'm just going to use a GLM example, um, but it actually applies to other types of models too. Um, so the expected value, you know, is the expected value of Y, which is your model is, you know, beta zero plus beta one X one, which in model matrix term is just X times beta. Well, if you add weights, then you have like an X times W times beta. So it means that different observations get weighted differently. So let's say you're predicting insurance claims and you have different lengths of policy period in months. So your exposure is the number of months um, of the policy. You know that policies that are longer are going to have more claims. So that's your weight. So then what's an offset? So an offset is a way of um, forcing, it's a way of adding a linear term to the um, predicted uh, to, let me say that an offset is just a constant that you add to your, um, that you, add, it's a constant variable that you add to your linear predictor. So I'm trying to think of an example. This is a real example. So uh, let's say that you are, you're, you're, you're an actuary and you're fitting a model for life insurance. Let's say it's mortality. Uh, 
let's just keep it at claims cost. And so you have, you have, or you already have, you already have your predicted value. Like, let's say this is y hat um, one. So this was like, you know, some actuaries in 1990 created a model for predicting claim costs. And then you want to compare that to, um, you know, your new model. Once you've added in new, uh, new data, you know, you're, you're using um, a lasso regression, you've done all this fancy feature engineering and so forth. So like, why, why, let's say like why one was just really simple. It was just like, you know, X one plus X two. And then Y two was, you know, X one, X two, X three, X 37. Um, and you wanted to know, um, does this model improve upon this model? Um, so you could, so rather than having to refit the whole um, model, you could just use this as a predictor into this model. So you'd say y is equal to beta zero plus beta um, plus um, this is y2 y1 plus beta 1 x whatever 1 beta 2 x2 plus right so if you so this is just the constant term or you can think about it as a, having a coefficient of 1 so if you were to look at this in a table you'd see um, beta 0 well let's just say that this is person here's bob Here's Sarah, here's Sam, right? The intercept is the same for all people. 1.5, 1.5, just some number. And then this is going to be different because this was the model that we fit in 1999. So this might be 37, 199, and so forth. And then you have um, these. So you have the coefficient times that person's variable. So you know you have beta one times x one. So let's say Bob, let's say it says so this might be different for each person. And, the, and all of these would be different for each person. But this uh, coefficient is chosen based on the maximum likelihood. So these are actually you know estimated. That's why they have this, this hat on them. Whereas this isn't estimated, it's treated as a constant. So that's the offset. So the reason why you'd use an offset in this case is so that you don't change everything that was done in 1990. You could just use the, those same, um, that same model and then you know, fit the new model on top of it. So from a regulatory perspective, that can make it easier. You, you wouldn't have to, um, you know, get all of this new new information past regulators uh, or, or you, you already know that it's working. It's already worked for 20 years. Let's keep using that and then we'll just try to improve upon it. Uh, so it is 2.53, so we do have uh, seven minutes left. Um, if anyone has any other last minute questions, uh, you just send them to me in an email. Um, I am going to be online for the next week. If you have uh, exams that you want graded, uh, maybe you've answered a question in a new way you've used a different type of model than what you've seen in our solutions, or you just want feedback. You wanna know, am I doing this right? Uh, how could I improve? 
um, you know, I gave myself a grade of 90 on this exam. You know, do you agree with that? Do you think that you would actually get a 90? Um, I'll give you some feedback. Um, if enough people send in their, their, their exams to be graded, I can even help um, to give you some comparisons. I'll keep everything anonymous, of course, but I'll be able to say, you know, a lot of people seem to be having difficulty with hierarchical clustering. Um, you know, here, here's some other resources that you can use. Um, yeah, and, and uh, if you do like, um, yeah, and the other, other thing I would just say is just focus on, you know, consistency. You, you don't need to, you don't need to be like 100, you don't need, you're not going to be able to learn everything. Um, there's just not enough time, you know, and it's better to focus on your routine of you know, sitting down for five hours, you know, waking up at the right time and just churning out words on the page, you know, being able to type quickly. Uh, those are the, the intangibles, like in baseball, you know, you'd say like a player is like an intangible asset because, you know, they're going to always play in the game. They're not going to get injured. Um, they're, they're going to be, they're going to have a good eye, you know, they'll get on base a lot of times, even if he's on a hot streak, even if he's hitting home runs, you know, he'll still be, uh, an intangible asset. So just try to focus on your intangible assets, like, um, you know, writing cleanly, you know, not making grammatical mistakes. Uh, you know, I said studying at the right time, um, using right, right formatting, you know, um, making things in, in nice subheadings, uh, using bold when you need to, um, and also your process, um, as you do practice exams, you'll just be able to know, oh, I'm spending too much time on this question. This is only a five point question. I've already spent 30 minutes. I really need to keep going. Um, uh, that's going to help you out a lot. Uh, regardless of what you see on the test. Um, one other thing to note is that um, I, I think when the results come out, um, you will have a better idea of how you did because there's only one practice exam. There's only one version of this exam. In the past, there were two, two versions. And so when you looked on online and, and on Reddit or actuarial outpost, um, you couldn't compare yourself to everyone, but now everyone's taking the same test. <laughs> um, so don't let that sort of discourage you because, you know, oftentimes, um, you know, what people post online is misleading. Um, honestly, it's, it's the, in my experience, it's the people who are posting online, they're sort of insecure that want to get validation, or it's the people who like completely aced it that studied 600 hours and they want to brag, you know, so don't base your, your, um, your, uh, your thought of how well you did you know, just based on that. Um, so that is it for, for, for this webinar. Uh, yeah, thank you for everyone for joining. Uh, feel free to uh, email me your follow-up questions. Best of luck on this exam. I know you're going to crush it because you're already on this webinar. You've already taken this course. You've already sat through all these lectures. You've already grinded out all of these uh, practice exams. And uh, yeah, you, you have everything that you need. You just got to go there and you just got to execute.